Welcome back. So today we're going to talk about phylogeny. Now phylogeny is really talking about setting up diagrams for evolution. So all of life is related through a common ancestor. Um, if we go back and talk about uh, the history of life on Earth, it's all going to start as a single-celled organism, and then over time, those single-celled organisms became multicellular organisms, and those multicellular organisms started to differentiate and have different types of cells and different tissues, and those tissues formed organs, and those organs formed organ systems, and the organ systems formed organisms, these very complex, multicellular, multi-tissue, multi-organ, multi-organ system individuals. So phylogeny is the uh, evolutionary history of these relationships, looking at how things started very simple and they branched off into different, more complex um, organisms. So a phylogenetic tree is a diagram diagrammatic reconstruction of the history. So we use these phylogenetic trees to really create these diagrams or these depictions of how things branched off. So an ancestor and its descendant populations form a linkage shown as the line drawn on a on a time axis. So um, usually when we are going to make a phylogenetic tree, um, sometimes you'll hear people talk about phylogenetic trees as family trees or evolutionary trees or sometimes even cladograms all really referring to the same thing. And when we're looking at things, we're going to have these different branches. So when we look at um, one branch, we could say that this is a lineage. And you're usually it's going to show you time at the bottom, showing you that, hey, time is going this way. So we know that as we move forward, we're getting closer and closer to, we could put present day right here. Um, and then when you look at a specific node, all right, when a single uh, lineage divides into two, it's depicted as a split or a node. So right here would be a split or a node. Sometimes you'll see these little dots that they put in. Those dots are to usually depict a characteristic or a trait. Okay, um, but when you see the splits, those are known as nodes. So you have these lineages or these links and or linkages, and then you you have these um, these nodes. So then um, as the lineages uh, continue to split over time, the the history can be represented in the form of a branching tree. So that's why you hear uh, we them hear us call them phylogenetic trees or evolutionary trees because they have these branches to them and we call them uh, trees. So it starts out very, very uh, simple as a, a lineage and then it's going to split off into different lineages. And um, you know, the, it splits at those nodes. And when you start to create all these different branches, then you're going to really see how it becomes a tree, a diagram um, where that we call a tree. So a phylogenetic tree may portray the evolutionary history of all life forms. Okay, you can really try to make, uh, they, they call it the tree of life, where it really tries to show all of the life forms and how it started from uh, the same common ancestor to all living things. And it branched off into all the different living things that are no longer alive and are alive to today. But we can kind of home in on um, more specific lineages and look at just uh, segments of organisms. So it doesn't have to be all life forms. You can also look at major evolutionary groups, with, which a lot of times we like to look at. And then you can look at small groups of closely related species, which we also like to do. Or you can look at individuals, populations, as well as you can really look at DNA or genes. So um, if you look at this, this is showing you uh, major um, species that have, have come along. If This is just looking at apes. So we have a common ancestor back here, some kind of ape that eventually led to the other types of apes. apes. And we like to refer to this as the root of the tree. So you have your common ancestor in this specific tree. Is uh, um, This is the common ancestor. If we were to make another tree, maybe something else is a common ancestor. If we were to go further back in time, there'd be an even more ancient common ancestor to even more organisms. So it really depends on what you are talking about, what you're looking at. But for this specific diagram, 
we have um, this right here, this organism uh, represents, or this spot right here represents the organism that is the common ancestor to everything that comes after this on that tree. So, like I said, down here it's going to show you time often. And even if it doesn't show you time, you do know that as you move on and there becomes more branches, um, there's going to be, um, you're going to be moving closer to the present. Even if it doesn't show you all the way up to the present, you know that time is moving in the direction towards typically more branching. So a, a timing of splitting events is shown by, by a, a, a position of nodes on a time axis. So we can use this to kind of create um, a, a, a timeline along with the, that branching tree. And the splits represent events such as a speciation event where uh, one one species or one organism split into two different species. You can use it to represent a gene duplication event for um, if you're looking at different genes, how you know this gene uh, stayed the same and this there was a mutation and, and we, we saw that the gene changed and these organisms ended up with, with the, the changed gene. These organisms ended up with the old gene or even a transmission event for um, if you're looking at, at viral lineages like um, COVID-19 or HIV, these can also be um, uh, portrayed in a phylogenetic tree. So you have vertical distances between branches. Um, they do not have any meaning. So as, as much as the hor looking at the horizontal, that is going to be time. When we're looking at vertical distances, that doesn't really mean anything necessarily. Um, you can they they can try to use them to show you how closely related things are, um, but typically for our purposes, you're not going to have to worry about the the vertical distance so much. Now we call the groups of different species. We like to kind of create groups, and anytime you're going to create some kind of group, we're going to call it a taxon. So any group of species that you're talking about, no matter if it's a small group of different types of species, a big, if you're just looking at, oh, different types of foxes, okay, that, that might be um, a, a taxon, but also all the different types of canines could be a taxon, or all the types of mammals could be a taxon, so it really depends. What we like to look at are clads, and uh, clads are going to be uh, groups or taxons that consist of all the the evolutionary dis, uh, descendants of a common ancestor. So we like to really look at these clads where it's everything that is, is semi-closely related to each other. And you're going to identify a clad by picking any point on the tree and tracing all the descendant lineages. So like we said, we have this our root right here or our common ancestor. And then we can come up with uh, these different um, um, taxons where we say, hey, you know, um, these are all of these are our vertebrates. Okay, but we might want to look more closely at um, a, a clad of mammals. Okay, where we're, we're looking at um, chimpanzees and other apes, but we're also looking at um, mice and, and other um, mammals that are, are part of that group. So you have sister species, which are going to be two species that are each other's closest relatives. So if you if you go back, all right, in this diagram, if I was trying to look for a sister species, I would see, hey, you know what? These two are the most closely related to each other of everything on this diagram. And then you also have sister clads, which are going to be any two clads or, or, or small groups that are each other's closest relatives. So sister species, talking about specific species, and then sister clads, which are going to be talking about specific groups. So, um, you know, sister just means they're the most closely related organisms. They, they descended rather recently in the big scope of evolutionary history. So before the 1980s, phylogenetic trees were used mostly in evolutionary biology and systematics, um, which is the study and classification of biodiversity. Now, today we can use it for just about anything, uh, molecular biology, physiology, biomedicine, behavior, uh, animal behavior ecology, and virtually all other fields that are part of the life sciences or biology. So 
Um, as new species are discovered, phylogenetic analyses are reviewed and revised, and we're seeing that um, you know the tree of, uh, of life's evolutionary framework allows us to make predictions about behavior, ecology, physiology, genetics, morphology, and also really evolution. Um, we have homologous features, or sometimes called homologous structures, and they are shared by two or more species because somewhere along the way they were they have a uh, a common ancestor. They are ultimately related in the big scope of things. So they can be any heritable traits, including DNA sequence, protein structures, or even what we like to really look at because it makes sense is anatomical structures as well as behavior patterns. So if we're going to look at anatomical structures, you can see things uh, like like uh, 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 wings or, or bone structures. So um, each char character of an organism evolves from one condition, which is going to be the ancestral trait, uh, trait which is going to then uh, form another condition, which is the, the derived trait. Um, shared derived traits provide evidence of common ancestry um, of a group, and they are called um, synap synapomorphies, okay? So the, the vertebral column is a synapomorphy of the um, vertebrates. They all are going to have that, which shows how they all vertebrates are related along the way. They have that similar derived uh, trait. Um, so the ancestral trait was an undivided supporting rod, and then you have that derived trait that came from it, which all vertebrates are going to have as, as a ultimately a homologous structure. So, but there are some traits that you're going to see where um, it's, it's a result of what we call convergent evolution. It's not a homologous structure. It's just a structure that is um, very similar because they uh, must have had the same selective pressure, and that same selective pressure resulted in um, having similar features, but it's not because they are closely related. So when we look at homologous structures, all right, this is um, showing you how um, there are similar similarities in our bones, and if you even look at um, a human arm, we kind of have a similar structure where you're going to have, you know, that, that shoulder girdle and then you're going to have one bone two bones and then a bunch of little bones and then you're going to have these projections okay and the same thing kind of goes for this bird where they're going to have this girdle you're going to have one bone then you have two bones and then you have a bunch of little bones and then some other projection bones as well in the human hand same thing you have a shoulder girdle and then you're going to have one long bone connected to two bones Okay, and then you're going to have a bunch of little bones in your wrist, and then you're going to have these projections as your fingers. So these are homologous structures. Um, as, as far as the wings themselves, they are not homologous structures. The bat and the bird, they formed wings separately. So they didn't come from, the, the, the wing didn't come from a common ancestor. They formed wings separately, but they if we go back far enough before they had wings, they um, had this bone structure. So the bones are homologous structures, but the, the wings themselves, the, the idea of, okay, well, now this has this kind of membrane to it, which forms a bat wing, and these have feathers. Those were formed separately. They are not homologous structures. They, are, uh, they show really convergent evolution because uh, um, they, they ended up both having wings, but it wasn't because of the fact that they uh, um, are, are related, it's really because they ended up needing that for survival. So homologous structure versus convo convergent evolution, two different things, so often confusing. So in any evolutionary reversal, a character reverts from a derived state back to an ancestral state, which does happen. And these does happen. And these two types of traits are called homoplastic traits or hom homoplasies or homoplasies, um, a trait may be ancestral or derived depending on the point of reference that you're looking at on your phylogenetic tree or, or in um, um, the, the big scope of, of life on Earth. So um, an example, feathers are an ancestral trait for modern birds, but in phylogeny, of all living vertebrates, they are de a derived trait found only in birds. 
So to construct a phylogenetic tree, we're typically going to have an in-group, the group that we are focusing on or our primary interest. And then you're going to have your out out group, which is a species known to be closely related, but uh, have many different traits than our in-group. So if you look at something like, um, uh, if we looked at all these different organisms, okay, and you can really see that, you know what, we know that lamprey, which are very simple kind of fish, they um, they don't have all these traits that these more complex organisms have. But we know that, you know, if we look at their DNA, we know that they are related. Um, they share a common ancestor. But the lamprey would be our outgroup because they don't have any of the traits that we look at when we're looking at, excuse me, the rest of the organism. So they don't have a jaw, they don't have lungs, claws, gizzards, feathers, fur, mammary glands, or keratinous um, scales. Uh, so, but when you start to look, you can start to kind of come up with a phylogenetic tree of which ones are most closely related and which ones are not very closely related. So, we know that, you know what, after the lamprey, there must have been the perch because the perch started to have jaws, but then it didn't have anything after that. And then after that, you know, we might say, okay, then came the salamander, and then after the salamander came the lizard. All right, and we see that the lizard also has scales. So now you can start to look at, you know what? This lizard and this crocodile must be pretty closely related because they have all these things. The only thing that separates them is the gizzard. And then you have a pigeon, which also is going to be very similar, except now it has feathers. So you, you have these branching events going on. And then when you get down to the mouse and the chimpanzee, you see that something must have happened where now they lost these traits. But now these two must be closely related to each other in their own right because they have these new traits that are going on. So um, a trait that is present in both the in-group and the out-group must have evolved before the origin of the in-group and thus is, an an is, is ancestral for the in-group. In in all right, so something that the lamprey has, that's going to be an ancestral trait because the lamprey, um, you know, that, that's part of our outgroup. So if it's part of just the in-group, then we're going to say that it's a derived trait. If it's part of the outgroup as well, then we're going to say it's an ancestral trait. Traits present in only some members of the in-group must be derived traits. All right, so if, they, they're, if you only see some of them in that in-group, they must be derived. They came along afterwards. Some of the, the individuals in the in-group have them. Some of them do not have them. So when we look at traits, all right, like I said, we put little dots. And, okay, jaws came along. And you see that, like we said, all right, the perch, right, they have the jaws, but they don't have anything else. So they must have branched off first from this, this uh, common ancestor, okay, branched off became the perch. Then we go along, starts to have lungs. Everything after this point has lungs. But we see the salamander, all right, it doesn't have any claws. So it's going to go that way. Then everything after this has claws. And we see that, you know what, when you go, if you start branching off this way, we see fur mammary glands, which is going to be part of the mice and the chimpanzees. But if you go this way, they don't have fur and mammary glands, but they start to have, they have scales. Um, uh, and then you go on and you, they have these other new traits. So we had to notice this where, hey, now these organisms are not going to have anything that's going to happen when we go this way. And these organisms are not going to have anything when we talk about going this way, okay? So that's how we're able to form our phylogenetic tree. Uh, apart from using DNA, which is really the, the primary way that we do it now, you can look at these morphological traits or, or these characteristics and come up with an idea of which organisms must be closely related and which ones must be not as closely related. So construction of phylogenetic trees has been revolutionized by using computer technology, genome sequencing, looking at DNA. It, it's really uh, molecular biology has really changed everything. You're, we can look at uh, different types of proteins and, and the chemicals in um, an organism's body. We can look at the genome, look at the DNA, the genes. 
um, that has really changed things uh, apart from a way changed things uh, since the way they used to do it, where it was all based on traits and, and, and looking at the, the characteristics of organisms and their morphology. So any trait that is genetically determined can be used in a phylogenetic analysis. Evidence comes from the studies of morphology, which is how they always did it. All right, Development is another one, looking at how things develop. What do you look like before you are fully developed? The fossil record. Um, be, uh, behavioral traits, and then now we can look at molecular traits as well, which is, uh, has really changed the field of evolutionary biology as well as uh, phylogeny. So morphology is the presence, size, shape, or any other attributes of body parts. Phylogeny is in most extinct species depend almost exclusively on morphology because we don't have uh, the, the DNA to analyze. Fossils provide evidence that helps distinguish an ancestral from derived traits. Um, you have limitations to morphology, of course. So some taxa are, are taxon. Um, the, the different taxons are, uh, or taxa, I should say, show few morphological differences. Um, it's difficult to compare uh, distantly related species. And some morphological variation is caused by the environment. Also looking at development. So if we look at how things start and how they end up, um, we can see how, you know, it, as much as they might look very different as adults, so you see, um, you know, something like a, um, a, 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 a sea, sea sponge, or I'm sorry, a, a sea squirt, or a, a frog, you know, they look very different as adults, but when you go back, hey, you know what, morphologically, during development, they are very similar, where they both are this kind of long tube, and they have a neural tube to them, along with a notochord. Paleontology, all right, this is looking at the fossils. Um, behavior, looking at the traits. Molecular uh, data, by looking at the DNA. And um, we can use mathematical mo models in order to describe DNA changes over time. Uh, maximum likelihood uh, methods identify the tree that most likely produced the observed data. They incorporate more in information about evolutionary change than um, par parsimony, uh, uh, parsimony uh, methods. So phylogenetic trees can be tested with computer simulations and by experiments on living organisms. And as time goes on, we improve those, those computer systems and we improve on the data that we have collected and that we can use in order to better understand um, the, the phylogenetic trees. So some applications of phylogenetic trees, we can reconstruct the, the past events. Um, in zoonotic diseases, such as um, ones that infect humans, it's important to understand when, where, and how disease first entered a human population. One example is looking at HIV. Now, there's different strains of HIV, and we can look at those different strains and see how they have made their way through the human population. So phylogenies are important for understanding the global diversity of HIV and determining the origins in the human population. One example is... Um, the uh, HIV-1 uh, versus HIV-2. So you see in if we were to, to trace the uh, phylogenetic tree of HIV, we have a common ancestor virus, and then it branched off, and eventually it became um, HIV-2 and HIV-1, but you see that they are not very closely related. The HIV-1 is more closely related to the SIV-CPZ um, in, that we find in chimpanzees than it is to HIV-2. Same thing goes for um, HIV-2 is more closely related to the SIV at SYK, which is found in monkeys, um, than it is related to HIV-2. So we can kind of trace back um, the, the mutations and the change in these, these viruses as time goes on and see how closely related they are. And it could really help us to figure out a way that we can combat these things. If we learn that these things are very different, and we're all we're trying to fight uh, the, the. We have two different types of HIV that are found in humans, and we're trying to fight them, um, fight both of them with the same type of meds. And we come to find out, you know what? We have to attack them differently. Then that helps us to better understand the treatment for the different ones. And then we say, hey, you know what? We need to test individuals, not just if they have HIV, but do they have this strain or this strain or some new strain. So forensic investigations that involve viral transmission involve uh, a case study where 
Uh, a physician was accused of injecting blood from an HIV positive patient into his former girlfriend in an attempt to kill her. And phylogenetic analysis revealed that the HIV strains present in the girlfriend were a subset of those present in the physician's patient. So the physician said, you know what, I don't know anything about this. I'm not, I didn't, you know, she just happened to become HIV positive, has nothing to do with me. And they were able to go back and say, you know what, she has the same exact strain as um, ones that you came in contact with and you would have had access to. And that's further evidence for forensic investigators and, and, and uh, law enforcement to prosecute this individual and say, you know what, we have evidence here that he had access to this strain and he injected it into or, or, or he um, infected his girlfriend or his ex-girlfriend with this strain of HIV. So you can form these um, phylogenetic trees and, and look at the different strains of HIV and then you see, you know what, you had access to this strain right here and then guess what? Your patient, one patient had that strain, another patient had that strain, and you actually injected your um, uh, uh, your ex girlfriend with that strain. So molecular clocks can also be used. All right, so a molecular clock uses the um, average rate at which a given gene or protein accumulates uh, changes to gauge the time of divergence. So you know we can come up with an idea of you know how long does it take for a mutation to occur and then by looking at how many mutations have occurred um, between species we can see how long it took for um, that species to evolve from one species to the next species so this just shows you you know if you look at um, the the amount of changes in the amino acid sequences or the proteins that are built built from the DNA sequence from the DNA instructions we can see that you know um, uh, um, one one change, all right, um, or, or a proportion of 1.0 is going to be about 500 million years. So it takes a long time to see big changes. And by looking at the minor changes, we can pinpoint, all right, well, you know, maybe it was 50, um, 50 million years ago, or was it 300 million years ago? And we can use this as a molecular clock to see um uh, how long has it been that they evolved? So a molecular clock was used to establish the time when HIV-1 first entered human populations from chimpanzee pro populations. And um, they they actually saw that the common ancestor of this group of HIV-1 viruses uh, can be determined with an estimated date of origin of about 1930. So they were able to see that in 1930, that is when HIV-1 hopped from chimpanzees to humans. And they can do this with with all sorts of viruses and really understand when was it you know you, you look at something like MERS that 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 hops from from camels to humans and they can pinpoint when it was that that occurred um, and this shows you the diagram of the different strains and how um, it was able to hop and 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 um, and move throughout the the human population throughout the years. Um, and just lastly, when we are talking moving forward about different species, we are going to want to use the binomial nomenclature and understand that different organisms, um, you know, if, if you talk about a fox, well, you, you know, if I'm talking about a fox in, in the Northeast, you know, maybe there's only one type of fox around here. But if I'm talking to someone in another country, I say the word fox, they might be thinking about something completely different because there are different species of foxes throughout throughout the world. So what we like to use is this binomial nomenclature, which is going to use a more specific name, which is based on their genus and their species. And that's how we come up with something like Homo sapiens. Homo is the genus. Okay, so anything that's part of that genus is going to start with Homo. And then the specific um, species within that genus is going to be the second word. And we always write it like this, italicized. First word has a capital letter. Second word does not have the first letter capitalized and it's always going to be italicized so keep these things in mind as we move forward and we talk more about phylogenetic trees and which organisms are related and which organisms derive from other organisms or and and um and and how this really took place over time and what it really means for us all right